Okay, what then, anyone tell me, is the price of freedom? What's the price of freedom? It's a well-known saying. Yes? She's cheating, she was here earlier. <laughs> yes, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Eternal vigilance. It was attributed to Thomas Jefferson, who was a founding father and third president of the United States, but there's no evidence to confirm that he ever said it or wrote it. But we can be absolutely sure that Jesus said something very similar in this amazing chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel, and you'll find it too in Matthew 24. And what Jesus says here is relevant to our century, the 21st century, just as much as it was relevant in the first century when he spoke it. And it's Jesus who's speaking here, the Jesus we believe in and worship and follow. And he's speaking it to us because he wants us to take it in. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. So what did he say in this chapter? He said this, verse five, Jesus said to them, watch out. Verse nine, you must be on your guard. Verse 23, be on your guard. Verse 33, be on your guard, alert. Verse 35, therefore keep watch. Verse 37, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Eternal vigilance is indeed the price of freedom. Keeping careful watch is urged on us all by our Lord. So what's the context for this? Well, today is Advent Sunday, 28th of November, 2021. Many people, if they notice it at all, think mistakenly that Advent is only the time for getting ready for Christmas. I think Chris, uh, Fear, Steve is a little bit like this. <laughs> it's more than getting ready for Christmas. The Advent calendars are out today. The adverts are on telly. Uh, kids are clamoring for presents and writing their lists. Parents are worrying about increasing costs and getting deeper into debt. And please don't misunderstand me. I love Christmas. I love Christmas and all its trimmings. And uh, I love celebrating Christmas. I love the Christmas story. I love all the things about the birth of Jesus. The angels, the carols, the guards, the candles, the family festivities, the good food. I love it all. Ask Chris, she will tell you. And the trees lit up tonight. Hope you're coming. But Advent is about much more than this. It's more about looking forward in hope to our Lord's promised return rather than looking back to his first coming at Bethlehem. So, first of all, let me put it like this. We're at the end of November. The days are shorter. The nights are longer. And ask Festo, the weather is getting colder. <laughs> so it's dark. John Betjeman's poem about Advent reflects this. The Advent wind begins to stir like sea-like sounds in our Scotch fir. It's dark at breakfast, dark at tea, and in between we only see clouds hurrying across the sky and rain-wet roads the wind blows dry and branches bending to the gale against the skies all silver pale. This is the setting for Advent. It's getting darker. And what is true in nature is also true in life. I could depress you terribly much this morning by dwelling on this, but I don't intend to. But Jesus does talk about these things, and it's right in the passage that we look at them. 
We could focus on terrorism, Afghanistan, pandemics, epidemics, global warming and all its consequences, broken homes, screwed up children, more and more people suffering from anxiety and depression and loneliness. And true faith is so rare in this self-centered, self-indulgent, secular age. It is very dark in the world in which we're living. But Advent, dear Christians, is a time for shining hope into this darkness. And Jesus says, when all these things are going on around you, the danger is to get depressed, to give up, to switch off, to get sidetracked, to get discouraged and lose heart. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, he warns us, and it becomes unfruitful. But he's telling us these things so that we can watch out for them. He's teaching us to remain eternally vigilant. So there are two major events in history that Jesus is describing in this chapter and in chapter 24 of Matthew. The first is the catastrophic destruction of the magnificent temple in Jerusalem. In verse 1, this is the setting. As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And they were. And if we'd been there, we'd have been saying the same things. Blocks of cream stone overlaid with gold, one meter high, five meters wide. And the whole temple complex covering an area of 450 meters by 300 meters. It was a wow experience. And people came from all over the world to see it and to worship there. Two chapters before this, Jesus cleared the temple. And he made it clear that even a glorious building can become a den of thieves. It's not how beautiful the building that matters. It's what's going on inside it. I hope dear Andy Day from our Methodist church and friends is right when he says that that beautiful Methodist church which is to be sold will not stop the church functioning there in the town. Do you see these great buildings, said Jesus? Not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. The wow must have died on the disciples' lips, replaced with expressions of horror, dismay, and disbelief. How can this happen? And later in verse 3, when Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley at this beautiful temple in the sunshine, four of his closest friends come to him as they sat on the Mount of Olives, and uh, they asked him questions. Tell us, they said, when will these things happen? And in Matthew 24, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? I guess in their minds, the two events were inseparable. The destruction of the temple and the end of the age. Well, they couldn't see beyond the destruction of the temple. The return of Jesus with great power and glory must come about then, surely. As Jesus predicted here and within a generation, the temple was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Here we are in the 21st century and we await our Lord's promised return still. Advent is about preparing for Christmas and celebrating his first coming as a baby in Bethlehem. Of course it is. But it's much more about being ready for his second coming, keeping a sharp lookout for all the signs mentioned here, and faithfully participating and serving him as we await his promised return. <clears throat> Jesus said, watch as if your life depends on it, because it does. 
The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. So watch out for these signs taking place in the world. Well, we're very familiar with them. Widespread deception, people being led astray in all sorts of ways. False messiahs, false Christs, false hopes, false beliefs. Fabulous claims being made and miracles performed. And Jesus says we're to stay close to him. He is the Jesus of the Bible. He is the Jesus of the apostles. There is only one Jesus. The only one is the one who is speaking here, the authentic Jesus. So he says, beware of all these things. Many will be led astray. So be on your guard. I don't want to dwell on this this morning, but just let me list one or two of the other things he mentions. Widespread disruption and violence, man-made things and natural things. Great tribulation, great trouble, wars, rumors of wars. Don't be alarmed, said Jesus. These things will happen and must happen. Nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, with all the misery and pain and displacement that these things bring. We are so familiar with them. Then there are natural disasters like earthquakes and famines all over the place. And all these things, said Jesus, are like the beginning of birth pangs. Well, I've never had birth pangs, but many of you may have had. And uh, you know that they start with twinges, usually. And then they get worse, and they get worse, and they get stronger, and they get stronger until the baby is thankfully born. And don't speculate about dates, said Jesus. No one knows when the end will come. If anyone tells you they know, they're lying. Even I don't know, said Jesus. Even I don't know. Only the Father. It's a secret locked in his heart. The only other negative thing to look out for is widespread persecution of Christians. There will be arrests and betrayals and trials and so much hatred and violence and fear. But thankfully, said Jesus, the end will come. It will come to all these things. So don't get very depressed. Jesus is here to reassure us that in all the gloom and the doom, there are positive signs to look out for too. And I want to focus on these now. Advent is all about hope, looking forward in joyful expectation and anticipation to something very wonderful that is coming and that is promised. The darker it gets, the brighter must shine our hope like the stars on a dark night. While all these things are going on in the world, the gospel is going to be preached everywhere. Good news about Jesus. The hope we have in him is going to be proclaimed everywhere across the world. There'll be missionaries. We've been hearing about David and Mary. We've also for many years supported John and Paula in the Philippines. They've gone back to this uh, tribe of people they've been working with for many years. And uh, the Mangian people on an island in the Philippines, the island of Mindora. Um, and they're there for the last time. They're there to retire and coming back in February. What a wonderful ministry they've had. They've left a church behind that's functioning and flourishing. That has its own Bible college. And these things are happening across the world. And thousands are being converted to Christ across our world today. The kingdom is growing. And Jesus said, look out for those things and be encouraged. We're living in a world of opportunity and we all have a part to play in this. We're all here to witness to him in our daily lives. Remember, there's no such thing as an ordinary Christian. We are all amazing miracles of grace. And through broadcasts and books and television and radio and film and satellite broadcasts and the internet, 
through travel and communications, and many coming to our country, there are opportunities for the gospel to be preached and spread, and people responding to it in wonderful ways, so that from every tribe and language and culture and background, the kingdom will be full of such people. Keep your eyes on these, and in God's good time, the end will come. So let me end with two pictures Jesus gives us in this wonderful chapter. Here's the first, in verse 28. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree, he says. Nature has so much to teach us about the kingdom of God. And Jesus often used these illustrations when he was teaching. Now it's the fig tree. When you see the twigs getting tender and the leaves coming out, you know that summer is not far away. In the same way, when you see all these things happening in the world, you know that summer is near. Isn't that a lovely thought? Summer is near. It's on the way. The long night will pass with all its sighing and sorrow and pain and tears. I was a teacher for 40 years. I love the summer term. I love the summer term for many reasons, but one was I knew the summer holidays were coming. It was C.S. Lewis who said when he was talking about things like this, the term is over. The holidays have begun. I remember one summer we were living in Bradfield at the schoolhouse, at this beautiful village of Bradfield in Berkshire. And I was head of this lovely village school. And uh, the last of the buses had gone. The last of the cars had left the playground. The uh, parents and children had disappeared down school lane. The teachers had all gone home and the other staff closed the school door. And there next to our house was the car and we all piled into it. We were going to the next village, Stamford Dingley. We were going to celebrate the holidays. We were going to have afternoon tea at the singing kettle. And I was fizzing with the holiday spirit. The summer holidays spread endlessly before us, and it was wonderful. Now that is Advent. That's what Advent is all about. It's looking forward to that glorious day when our Lord returns. Look up, your redemption is drawing near. The other picture, of course, is uh, the one Jesus tells that we had read to us by Rachel. It's a well-regulated household. Everyone's got something to do. We've all got our jobs. We're all playing a part. And the house is running smoothly. And the master of the house announces he's going away for a while. So we're all to keep busy. We're all to keep serving and always ready and watching for his return because he's coming back. So keep going. Oh, he seems to be away for such a long time. 2,000 years? Well, in God's time scale, that's about two days. Two days. But he is coming back. All the signs are there. Let me put it like this. All the alarm bells are ringing across our world. We can't afford to be asleep. It's time to wake up. The alarms are going off. Open your eyes and watch, says Jesus. Goodness, is that the time? I must be up and doing. It's not time to be falling asleep. I can't laze around in bed. And what I say to you, I say to all, said Jesus, watch. So here on this Advent Sunday, with the first Advent candle lit, the price of freedom is still eternal vigilance.